So I'm not inside the box, now I am. Thank you. Um, yes, I will talk about five things about LARPing on sailing ships. Um, and these are lessons learned from about a dozen games I played and organized on sailing ships, mostly um, uh, pirate LARPs that I played. I uh, also organized one last year uh, for Jobak LARP Studios, which I'm now doing again this year in, in September, called Skull and Crossbones, which happens to be on three pirate ships uh, with cannons and everything you want. Um, and the second uh, is a game we played already four times and will be run a fifth time in November this year. It's called Demeter. And uh, it's telling the story, the true story of what happened when Dracula traveled on his ship from um, uh, Transylvania to uh, England. So this is my personal experience as a player, as a participant, and uh, as a LARP designer and organizer. And um, there are not so many sailing ship LARPs. Um, there is one in, I think, in April now in Italy happening. Um, there have been a few in the... Um, before a Czech uh, game and a lot of German games. F strangely enough, not many Nordic games with moving ships. So, and, and I hope that'll change in the future. Um, yeah, and um, one of the things that's important to remember is that the laws and the rules differ. They differ from country to country, they differ from ship to ship, because captains and the crew set the culture of their ship quite often. So this will not pertain to everything in the same manner, but this is, there are some common themes I will be talking about. And the first one is that space on a ship is different. On one hand, quite obviously, there is shitloads of space. You have the whole Baltic Sea in our games. Well, not maybe the whole one, but you could travel anywhere in, in the four or five days of, of uh, playing this LARP. So it's a huge environment that you're playing on. On the other end, it's the LARP the size of a tennis court, because that's about the size of the ship. And ships are pretty uh, pretty small, even if you have a big ship. The biggest one we have is like 44 meters. But even then, with 30 people on that ship, it can be very small. So you have these two dimensions. Um, one is huge, and it's nearly infinite. And the other one is very, very small, like a chamber LARP. And on top of that, you have the movement, which is also pretty uncommon. There's a few LARPs doing that, but most LARPs stay in one place. This one travels basically all the time, and you never know where you will end up. So this is one, one thing that changes the experience, because the, the space around you will change all the time, and still it stays the same, because it's the same ship. The second thing is that somebody else is in control. That is quite unusual for us LARP organizers. Usually we try to be in control of the game design and of the things happening in the LARP as far as we can do that. On a ship, there's somebody else who has that role. The captain usually is the one in control and the final arbiter in many things. Security and safety is obviously one of those, but also things like where do you travel? Which, which kind of route do you take? Which for a LARP has an important well, an important influence. Obviously, if you're going to that island where you have some tourists on the beach, that's not so interesting and not so good for the LARP as, as uh, going to somewhere more remote. And before, you, before the weather, is, uh, weather forecast comes out at night, you usually don't know what's been happening, what will be happening on the next, next day. So there was, there was a, a German LARP, uh, which I didn't participate in, where there were two ships and they were sailing. And one of the captains suddenly decides to go into a harbor that was not um, communicated before. And this is something that can happen if you do not have a good relation to the, to the crew on board the ship, which is part of uh, what, what we usually do as well with the location crews. But here it's, it's a lot more important that the captain is willing to give you part of that authority and, and responsibility for the participants in, in the event. So this is, this is one thing which, uh, which makes, makes uh, the LARPing different there and the organizing very different. Um, and this, this goes together with the question of flexibility. So we heard about emergent play today, we heard about what happened in, on location. Um, and these are things that in, in the ship LARP, we basically do not know where we will be the next day. So, one thing that happened, for instance, in Skull and Crossbones last year, where we were 
very much stressing that this LARP is a lot about sailing. The sailing experience is an important part. And then on the first day of the LARP, we had eight to nine before, which means even skilled sailors would be sick. So we could not sail for the whole day. That has kind of an influence on the, your experience of the LARP. So we had to, we had to change a lot of the plot around that. The things that we had planned had to move to other places. And we changed a lot on the fly. So the, the, the running of the game was all about looking where you could do actually stuff. So, um, and this goes well together with uh, what I coined 180 degrees illusion. <laughs> So we like this, this thought about 360 degree illusion or even more extreme in Parliament of Shadows where you had the, uh, the index reality where you, we act the actual places are that what, where you are. Here you have a mixture of that. On one hand, on the ship LARP, you can do stuff that your characters usually would be doing. As a pirate on the ship, you can set the sails. You're standing on the helm. You're climbing the rigging. All these things that are kind of difficult to do in many games. I mean, if, you, if you're playing a knight in the game, you probably will not ride a horse. Maybe you can do it. And sometimes you have that possibility, but quite often you don't get those possibilities. Here, basically all you can do on the ship is something your character could do. But then you turn around and there's a lifesaver. And so this is, this is something you have to take into account. There's a ship passing by. You cannot influence what your players will be seeing because this is changing all the time as well. So a, a good example for this is when you, when you climb the rigging, you will be wearing a harness for security reasons. Or if you go into the longboat rowing to shore, you have to wear a life vest, which comes to my Fifth point, being in a ship is like being in a jail with a chance of being drowned. <laughs> and if you don't wear a life vest, that might just happen. And it's, it's obvious, obviously, you, you cannot escape from this as long as you're traveling. If you're going to a remote island, there might not be a ferry leaving from there. So it's, it's really something that you have to take into account when you, when you do this. But on the other end, it's, it's a beautiful environment. It is something that you can actually immerse into. Some people actually jump into the water and swim, which is a wonderful experience, except for that one time when I was wearing a life vest and it was October and it was dark and there was 1.5 meter high waves and the life vest earned its name that day. But it's, it's, as I said before, it's a beautiful experience. It's something I can only recommend, and if you are interested, uh, I will be talking about the design of, of sailing gloves as well as Knudepunk. Thank you very much.